we've been talking about this whole on mission idea. Like uh, there's two words on mission that I feel like have just been pro- prophetically like deposited in my spirit. Uh, a few months ago, has been praying for where our church is headed and, and kind of the vision as we move forward. And we've been talking almost like over two months now on what it looks like to be living on mission together as a church, both individually and corporately. And I have to just say, and I want to celebrate for a second, like your response to this has been absolutely astonishing. Um, we have, over the past two months, begun to move forward in more ministries than we have over the past three years. There has been almost like um, like you've been activated, like uh, um, not just inspired or got like holy goosebumps to like a good idea, but like so many of you are just stepping up, ready and willing to launch into the things that the passions, the, the, the stirrings, the promptings of the Holy Spirit in your life. And I just want to take a moment and read. I'm just going to read through some of the things that we're currently launching when it comes to our care ministries. Um, in case, and if you want to get involved, then you can see Pastor Tom. Um, so here's, here's a few of the things. One, a visitation ministry. We've never had a vision, visitation ministry. Um, this is for the homebound, those in the hospital. Um, and this is both in person and over the telephone. We have a group of people that are just passionate about caring for those that, that can't even, that can't get here, that those that are watching online, those who are homebound, those, those who are sick. We're actually even looking into a possible opportunity in the jail and be able to do ministry in, 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 a, in the correctional facilities. Um, secondly, prayer, prayer team. We have a group of people that are literally met this past Sunday uh, to build a unified corporate culture of prayer here at New Life. Um, it involves men's morning prayer. The guys, some of the guys meet here at like 5.30 in the morning on Sundays. It involves pre-service prayer that are meeting and interceding for all of you and for our services. Uh, they're meeting to create just a strategic plan, not only for our church, but even for our dedicated prayer room that we have right through those doors. Um, so just things are just moving forward full, like full bore in that. We also, as far as discipleship, Pastor Trevor's working on launching Trek groups. He's going to be announcing it even to the men's breakfast this coming weekend. And uh, what those are just small groups of two to four people intentionally meeting um, for biblical discipleship within community. And he's been going through this and kind of doing beta groups and going to be launching that out for some of you to either lead or to be a part of really true, intentional, um, authentic, biblical discipleship together. Uh, We have crisis ministry. This is just over two months. Crisis ministry to abuse victims. We have over 25 people in active training for safe families for children. If you don't know what that is, it's literally where where we as the church come alongside families in crisis where DHHS would call us and say, hey, we have a family in crisis. Would you guys be able to help respite for the kids uh, to be so that they don't have to go into foster care, that we can help out and come alongside and, and, and care for families that desperately need help? Amen. Isn't that awesome? So it's like you guys are, some of you guys are like just running forward in that. Uh, We have a soul care team. You're like, what's a soul care team? I just found out this past week. I'm finding out about all this stuff. We have a core group of people that are just passionate about helping people get the help that they need. And so they've been meeting like diligently. They're going to be helping people get connected to mental, mental health and behavioral health resources, freedom ministries, like, like courses that we already have here at, the, at New Life, like Freedom in Christ and Freedom for Me. We have a Celebrate Recovery for those struggling with addiction. We're in the process of almost ready to launch a Living Waters ministry, which is for those that are struggling with relational and sexual brokenness. I mean, they're all across the board. God is moving, putting on the hearts of people. You, how can I help? What can we do to come alongside hurting broken people to, to provide hope in, in, in where they need it? Last but not least, we have a marriage mentoring ministry where trained mentor couples are going to come alongside other couples that are struggling and wanting to work on their marriage. And they go, they go together and, and, and those two couples actually begin to do life together and, to pour in, and, and they pour into them as they're struggling. All of these ministries are an example of you. Our church family, you, taking your chair and pulling up to the table and taking an active role and living on mission in the gifts and the passions and the talents and the dreams and all of those things that God has equipped you for to do the work of ministry. Honestly, as a staff, we're like, we're just trying to keep up with 
so many of you just stepping up and saying, I have a passion to do something. We're like, how can we help? (laughs) And you guys are running with it. Um, And I'll say this to you, and I say this a bit prophetically. I believe that what we're seeing now is but a glimpse of what is in the heart of God for this church um, and in for our community. Um, I have seen now for the, probably the past three years um, a vision of a Hope Center where, where we're not just event-driven like doing Fort Biddeford or Winterfest, but we're presence-driven where we actually would have a physical presence in downtown Biddeford where we're meeting um, the physical needs, the mental, emotional, and spiritual needs of, of, of the people of Biddeford to be an actual 24-7 presence uh, of hope and darkness. Amen? I'm just telling you, get ready, because I just feel like things are just moving forward in, in, in huge ways. So if God's put some things on your heart, talk to Pastor Tom. We'll help you, we'll help you see, see, see things to move forward. Um, I just have a passion to not just give handouts to people, but to give them a help up and empower them to all the fullest potential that God has for them. And so I believe that part of that, giving hope, isn't just a handout. It's actually giving hope so that they can become all that God's created them to be. Amen? All right. Cool. I know. It's awesome. I'm so excited about it. And this is, I'm literally, that's just a thumbnail sketch of all this cool stuff God's doing. Now, with all that as a backdrop, all those cool things that are going on, today I feel like I have a very strategic word for you, like very, very strategic as we endeavor to live on mission individually and corporately. Um, what does that look like? Uh, you may be thinking, okay, Pastor Justin, you've been You've been yabbing about living on mission for two months now. I, I get it. I want it. Cool. I'm on board. Let's move forward. I get this, but I don't know if God is speaking to me. Like, I don't know if God is telling what, what he's telling me to do. And the biggest question is this. Can I even hear the voice of God? And this question is the question that I want to tackle today. And that is this. Can I even hear the voice of God? And just saying that out loud in a room like this is there's a filter of all kinds of subjective experiences. Just thinking about, can I even hear the voice of God? Because some of you, depending on kind of your upbringing, maybe even your your church upbringing, you've been taught that you can't hear the voice of God because God doesn't speak anymore now that we have the Bible. And so don't look or act or think that he would even want to speak to you apart from his word. And so that's it. That's how he speaks to you. And so, no, you're waiting for something that doesn't happen. Others of you believe that God does speak today to other people. But you struggle with like, like I believe God speaks, but I just, I just don't think that he could or would or would even want to speak to me. It's kind of a waste of time, right? I, just, I don't think that that would be, I've just never heard his voice before. Others of you have had bad experiences, when it comes for people hearing from God. You've had spiritual leaders that have used their uh, words of prophecy or things like that as hurtful or manipulative ways to get you to do something, or maybe you've actually been scarred by it under the banner of thus saith the Lord. And so the idea of hearing from God is actually a hurtful or potentially troubling thought to you. Like, I don't even know if I want to hear from God because I've people have heard from God before and I've been hurt through it. And so today I want to demystify and take the fog out of the room and and really take a look at like what does it mean to hear from God? And I'm going to make an overarching statement, just kind of a thesis statement, and then we're going to like talk about it throughout, throughout today, and it's this. As a Christian, hearing God is not something you do. It's someone you are. Let me say that again. As a Christian... Hearing God is not something you do. It's someone you are. So why don't you turn with me to John chapter 10, and why don't you stand with me as we honor the reading of God's Word. John chapter 10. We're going to start in verse 1. I'm going to, I'm going to read 1 through 11, and these are the, the words of Jesus, and he's kind of, you'll see, he's relating. He talks a lot about sheep and, and shepherds. He says, Very truly, I tell you, Pharisees, Anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. 
When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. Therefore, Jesus said again, Very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The, sheep that, or the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that they might have life and have it to the full. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And then in verse 14, he says, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Lord, I, uh, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your word even when we don't quite understand it. I thank you for your word even when it's hard for us to grasp or when our experience doesn't match up with it. I pray that as we get into your word today that you would reveal it to our hearts, open up our eyes, open up our ears, open up our minds and our hearts to be able to receive your word and that we, we might find that our experience and our expectation level rises. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. So um, he says, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. And then he says, I know my sheep and my sheep know me. My sheep know my voice. And then he says, you are my sheep, which means that hearing God is not something you do, it's someone you are. You are my sheep, and I am the good shepherd. We are like sheep. Now, um, many of you, like myself, don't have much, um, many encounters with sheep. You've probably never been sheep herding. You, didn't, you wouldn't know a you wouldn't know what it's like to, to uh, tend to a flock of sheep. And there's a lot of sheep shepherd talk uh, all throughout the Bible. In fact, sheep are the most commonly mentioned animal in the Bible. Many of those times that it's mentioned in the Bible, the people of God are compared to sheep. Now, at first blush, it sounds kind of cool. Like, I don't know. I mean, I think of sheep, think of cute, cuddly, furry, make cool noises. Like, who wouldn't want to be compared to that? Like, that sounds... That's, that's a fine comparison, right? We kind of welcome that, the idea that we're a sheep. But sadly, uh, as you're about to find out, this comparison in, in context gives us a little more accurate description of, of what God is trying to tell us when he says, you are like sheep. Um, so let me, let me give you just three things that, sheep, uh, that we know about sheep. The first one is that sheep have a herd mentality. Sheep have a herd mentality. Essentially what I mean by that, it's a nice way of saying sheep are kind of dumb. Individually, they're not the smartest animal in the animal kingdom, but they're especially dumb in groups, in herds, in flocks, right? Um, several years ago, there was a news story out of eastern Turkey that reported 1,500 unshepherded sheep walked off a cliff one by one, right after another. <laughs> like just one, they just kept, just, just kept walking. One led the way. There was one dumb one that was like, this is a good idea. And then just started walking and the rest just kept following that one dumb sheep. It says over 400 of them died. And the other 1,100 survived. Do you know how? They landed on a big fluffy pillow, <laughs> saved by those that gave their lives. It's like, and they're just like bouncing around, just having a good old time. You can imagine, like, the other 1,100 had a, had a blast. They're like, we, they probably made the decision to do it again and didn't survive. But anyway, um, I, 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 they're not the smartest animals. Again, I'm not getting the comparison to humans either. It's weird. But anyway, um, sheep have a herd mentality. The second thing that we know about sheep is sheep are prone to wander. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 6 says, We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. 
Sheep are prone to wander. And it really doesn't matter if you place them in like the perfect environment with the perfect water source and the perfect pasture because sooner or later, they just wander off and get get into stupid when they have no shepherd. They... If, if there's no shepherd with the, you just kind of keeping them, corralling them, yelling at them, telling them, hey, where are you going? Hey, 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 what are you doing over there? One just walking off the cliff. You know, you just literally, if there's no shepherd, they just, they wander and they, they get into trouble and danger and some of, some of them die. Um, the third one is this, that sheep need protection. Sheep need protection. If you, um, if you think of a sheep, I mean, they're, they're big and fluffy but I'm not really scared of a, of a sheep because they don't really have anything to defend themselves with um, except for like cuteness and weird noises, right? Like if you put a sheep by himself into the wild, you've just given nature a snack. Like there is, there's no, there's nothing to protect them. They have no talons. They have no claws, um, just big fluffy, right? They, there's nothing that can hold back a hungry wolf. From, from the snack of a, a single sheep by themselves. And so when they do get attacked and they're in kind of a, a group of sheep, they just flock up and they start like running around in circles in like a complete panic, kind of like social media. You know what I'm talking about? No. Um, the point is this, sheep need a shepherd to protect them, to keep them together, to keep them from making dumb decisions on their own or together. And if you actually watch a shepherd, he's always talking to his sheep. Like they're, always, they're just continually just talking to these sheep. And when he yells and calls them, they come running towards him only when he calls them. And so when God says that like you are like sheep with, who need a shepherd, it's less of a cute, cuddly, furry compliment. And it has more to do with a very realistic assessment of who we are and what we need. Like we need his wisdom. We need his direction. We need his protection. He's like, you are like sheep, and I am the good shepherd. So if we're like sheep, then how is Jesus like the good shepherd? I'm glad you asked. Number one, um, in, your, in your notes, it says this, um, he calls audibles to, in order to lead you. Um, John chapter 10, verse 3 says, he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. I love this because God doesn't just want to talk to you. He actually calls you by name. And as a good father, he speaks identity over you. So he's not like, hey, Jimbo, hey, Pamela. He literally is calling identity over you. He names you beloved. He calls you son or daughter. He calls you adopted. He calls you chosen. He calls you a mighty warrior. He calls you friend. Like, this is the the good shepherd that calls you out, calls you by name, speaks identity over you, whether you feel like it or not. Your faith to hear the voice of God for yourself is oftentimes based on who you think you really are. Well, I just don't think that God would want to speak to me. I, I mean, I'm just this, or I'm just that, or I'm only that. God says, no, you're chosen. You are my son. You're beloved. You are a mighty warrior. And sometimes he needs to speak identity over us before we actually will believe that he even wants to speak to us. And so when you understand who you are in Jesus, then it will begin to change how you relate to God because you all of a sudden begin to realize he's a good dad. And good dads talk to their children. Good shepherds care for their flock. And maybe you're sitting here and you're like, well, God's just never like spoken to me before. Like, I just never, I never sensed his voice. I've never, he's never spoken to me or through me or anything like that. And here's what I would say is this, listen, don't water your theology down to your personal experience. Instead, raise up your personal expectation level to meet your theology. I'll say that again. Don't water your theology down to meet your own personal experience. Instead, raise up your personal expectation level to meet your theology. So what I mean by that, instead of saying, well, I've never heard God's voice, I just don't think that he wants to speak to me, we should be saying, hold up, hold up, hold up. What has God said in his word? And in light of that truth, I now expect my experience to be what he says is true. I realize that I may have never heard his voice or maybe I've never perceived it and he really has, 
But he says that he's a good father who speaks to his kids. He says that he's the good shepherd who calls me by name. And so if that's true and that's who I am in him, then I'm going to raise my personal expectation, my faith level up to expect what he says is true, not just what I've experienced. In other words, don't focus on your perceived ability to hear. Focus on his revealed desire to speak. That is what we, we should be focusing on. It says that not only does he call you by name, it says that he leads them out. He calls an audible to lead you. Anybody watch football in here? Anybody? No? Just a few. Okay, cool. Well, football's this game. It's kind of like soccer, but not. Um, it's American football. Um, in football, the quarterback has a very specific role, a very specific position on the field. Um, he's watching everything that's going on. Uh, paying attention to, to how the defense is lining up and kind of seeing what, what, every, what everything's going on. And, and oftentimes, the, the quarterback will call in what is called an audible, which changes the play at the last minute. And he does it because he may see threats that the whole team doesn't necessarily see, or, you know, he's got the play from the sideline, but it, now that he sees the defense, we got to call something different because... <laughs> This is not going to work the way that we called it. Um, and so he's reading the strategy of the opponent, and the rest of the team pivots on his words. They don't, when he calls an audible, he says, Omaha, you know, I don't know, whatever, they have weird names, right? They just call, like, as soon as, as soon as he speaks it, the whole team pivots. Not one of them stands up from their stance and goes, hold on, are you kidding me? I thought we were doing this. Now you're calling Omaha? Like, no, 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 I'm not doing that. We're doing something. I'm doing the play that they called. We're not doing no, everybody pivots. Everyone, all of a sudden, they, they may get up and switch position. They run different routes. Everything changes based on the one word from the quarterback as he calls an audible, and they know his voice. So not everybody can just be sitting there and be like, Omaha! Like, nobody can just call that. They know their QB's voice, even when they're not looking at him. And as soon as they hear his voice, they heed to his words, and they change their position, and they follow his lead. Do you realize that God did not just create the world, give it a spin, write a book, and then send you on your way? He didn't. He actually says that he's the good shepherd. He says that he's a good dad, um, and he wants to call audibles all day in your life, speaking identity over you when you feel like nothing to lead you, to protect you from doing stupid, to give you wisdom for today, decisions that you're facing when you're like, this isn't necessarily a right or wrong, this is just left or right, which one should I go? God is always calling audibles in your life, and you're be like, well, I don't know if I've ever heard him before. The second point is this, you hear his voice. Really? John chapter 10, verse 4. He says, when he's brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. Part of you knowing and you hearing his voice is that it's just innate. It's not something that you do. It's someone you are. Notice that it doesn't say they might know his voice. They could know his voice. They should know his voice. It says that they know his voice voice. If you are a believer today, you've already heard his voice. Like, wow, I don't, really? Why, why would I say that? Because how else do you get saved? Well, it was, it was Billy Graham. It was just, they sang just as I am and I came down. Or like, it was my pastor, my youth pastor when I was in, in ninth grade. Or it was the, the VBS director at the, at, when I was a little kid. Like, no, 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 no. Like, you heard his voice and you responded to it. You heard his call, and your heart leapt to it. You'd be like, I don't know if I've ever heard his voice. You wouldn't be here if you didn't. <laughs> and maybe you're like, I, I haven't even given my heart to you. I don't even know what this means. I, I'm here just because someone invited me, or I thought this was a Home Depot. I'm in the, I made a wrong turn. <laughs> I'm telling you, you've heard his voice. You've heard his voice. John 5.25 says this, Very truly I tell you, a time is coming and has now come 
when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. You have come to new life in Christ because you first heard his voice and then you responded to it. You repented because you were responding to his voice because it is his loving kindness that leads people to repentance. Jesus did not come as a behavioral help seminar to make bad people good people. He came to make dead people alive. And so he's saying like, no, 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 you were dead in sin. You heard my voice and you responded to it and now you are alive. And if he spoke to you when you were dead in sin, how much more do you think he wants to speak to you now that you're alive in Christ? Now that you have the Holy Spirit living on the inside of you, how mu- if he spoke to you when you didn't know him, when he died for you and you couldn't have cared less about him, how much more do you think he wants to be calling audibles in your life and speaking identity over you when you desperately need it? Amen? Think about this. When you were born, like as a baby, you, you probably don't remember. Maybe you do. you got really good memory. Um, you were born with the ability to hear. Um, you didn't do anything for it. You didn't have to grow ears. The, you had ears. You came out and the, you had ears. You, you didn't have to convince people to speak to you. Like, oh man, I wish these people, these oh, grown-ups, these, my mom or my... You didn't have to convince people to converse or to speak to you. You could just hear. It just happened. However, in order to understand, in order to make sense of the world, in order to, to realize that communication was happening, what you did have to do was you had to learn how to tune out the voices of chaos in the world and to tune in to the voice of the one who's holding you. As, as, as a little baby, you all of a sudden realize you recognize your mother's voice. You recognize your father's voice out of, out of a crowd of people. Your mom can call you and you're like, I better get to going because my mom's calling me because you know your mom's voice. You just know it. You separate it from the chaos of the world. Now, in the same way, when you're born again, when you're born again by the Spirit, you're born with the ability to hear from God. It's not something you do. It's someone you are. You didn't have to grow spiritual ears. You didn't have to convince God, God, I just wish God would speak to me. No, he says, I'm a good father who wants to give you good gifts. I'm, I'm a good shepherd, and you'll know my voice. But what you do have to do is you have to tune out the voices of chaos in the world and you have to tune in to the one who's holding you. Say, so God, I recognize you in the midst of all this chaos. I see you, I hear you, I sense you in the midst of all of this competition. You hear his voice and it is innate. But it's also learned. Maybe you're, maybe you're here today and you're like, well, God doesn't really talk to me. <laughs> I understand you say it's like natural to me. I just, here's what I, would, here's what I would say to you. He wants to. But I don't hear from God. He wants to. Think of how many books have been written, sermons have been preached about this topic. How to hear the voice of God. How to hear from God. And still, it is one of the biggest questions for me as a pastor how do we hear from God? How do we know if we hear from God? I don't know if I can hear from God. How do you hear from God? And I'm going to give you a real simple answer. It's not anything that, it's not a new revelation. It's not something you've never thought about before. So just buckle up. Um, in its simplest form, I personally began to hear from God more clearly through reading his word. If you want to hear God speak, read his word. If you want to hear God speak audibly, read it out loud. (laughs) Like, I want to hear the voice. I heard the voice of God audibly this morning. Every morning I do. It's amazing. (laughs) Here's my point. God sounds like what he wrote. He sounds like what he wrote. So if you think that you're hearing God and he doesn't sound like what he wrote, you probably aren't hearing God because God sounds like what he wrote. And the way to get to know what he sounds like is by getting familiar with what he wrote. Because otherwise, church, you will be simply listening to yourself or be confused about the chaos of the crowd around you and mistaking it for God. He sounds like what he wrote. 
Um, you get to know his voice by hearing, by reading, by getting into his word. And the extent that you desire to hear his voice is the extent that you will remain in his word. So if you want to start hearing his voice, crack open the book. It's a great first step. You'll start to hear him more clearly. I guarantee it. So hearing God is innate, it's learned, and the third one is it's matured. Um, it's a really interesting scripture here. There's Jesus talking to, well, he's praying, but he's praying in front of a whole bunch of, there's a whole crowd of people listening in. And there's a whole bunch of people that are hearing this whole scenario happen. So I'm just giving you a little backdrop. In John chapter 12, let's, let's pick it up in verse 27. It says this, Jesus is praying. He says, now my soul is troubled and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. And then it says, a voice came from heaven. And the voice said, I have glorified it and will glorify it again. And the crowd, catch this, this is where it gets interesting. The crowd that was there heard it. They heard this voice from heaven and said, it had thundered. Others said, an angel. An angel had spoken to them. Jesus said, this voice was for your benefit, not mine. Isn't it interesting? We see in this scenario, God speaks audibly. I mean, the audible voice of God, the thing that we're always waiting for. Like, if I could just hear God speak audibly, then I would be a total believer, right? If he could just speak to me audibly, then I would, I'd be like, I'd sell everything. I'd go and I'd move to Zimbabwe. I, I, would, I would be sold out, all in, no doubts. I'd be all in. Well, I, I, I don't necessarily know because we see here that God speaks audibly to a group of people. Look at their responses. Some of them heard it and they explain it away. Did you guys hear that thunder? That was weird. Never heard thunder sound like that before. Some of them heard it and they said, man, something spiritual just happened. Did you guys feel that? I got the goosebumps. Wow. But it wasn't for them. It, it was an angel speaking to Jesus. And Jesus cuts through all of it and he responds. He says, no, 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 guys. Hey, this was for you, not me. It's this reality that we can be in the presence of God and not even know it. We can hear the audible voice of God and explain it away or just call it spiritual. It's why two people, let's just say even in here today during worship, two people can be in the same worship service. One person, maybe the person sitting next to you, was just like in an all-out enthralled, like hands out there, probably smacking you on your shoulder. They didn't even care, right? They were just all into worship, having an absolutely life-changing experience with the presence of God. And the person sitting next to them was literally feeling like, ah, this is boring and irrelevant, and I cannot wait to give a bad Yelp review. Like, this is not, not, it's not going well. Like, I wonder, I wonder how often, and God doesn't just show up in church services. He shows up on your drive to work as you're listening to the radio, as you're listening to worship music. He shows up in your bedroom. Like God shows up everywhere. But I wonder how many times we're sitting and we're, we hear God speak to us and we have one of these two responses. Either we explain it away as, hmm, it must just be thunder. Or we say, well, that's something spiritual is happening. I got goosebumps but it isn't for me. And Jesus says, but it is. But it is for you. They all heard something. The whole crowd heard something. Catch this though. But they just understood what they heard according to their level of listening. Let me say that one more time. They all heard something, but they understood what they heard according to their level of listening. Think of it this way. I've got two kids. They're all grown up now. It's ridiculous. That just seems to happen. I don't know. Um, I've always spoken to my kids according to the way that they can understand it, though. When they were tiny little infants, it was like, say dada, say no mama, no dad, say dada. And they, because that's, that's all I wanted in the world. Just say, just say something, kid. And the, the best thing you could say is me, right? Just say me. Just say dada. And uh, that's how you talk to a little baby, because that's, that's all you can really expect them to understand or maybe even repeat back to you. 
And then as they become little toddlers, you're like, good job. You want poo-poo in a potty? Good job. And they're like, yeah, want poo-poo in a potty. Right? And they're just thinking, they're just the, the bee's knees. They're just like, this is awesome. I just, I'm kind of like a poo-poo on the potty. And everyone's like, you're amazing. And I'm like, don't. Yeah, tell me, tell me something I don't know. Now, as teens and young adults, as they grow up, one's 16, almost 17, the other one's 19, like they understand higher vocabulary now. They understand complex ideas. They're taking classes in high school and college that I don't even understand. They're understanding like, things like nuance and my love language, sarcasm, and like all of these things that like, it's great because I can now talk to them as adults, they understand everything. Now, I've never expected their ability to listen to match my ability to speak. It's matured over time, as they have matured over time. I've never I've never expected their ability to listen to match my ability to speak. So when my four-year-old son, Carter, asked me, hey, Dad, what's a rainbow? I'll tell you what I didn't say. I didn't say, well, son, that, I'm glad you asked, because it is a phenomenon caused by refraction and dispersion of the sun's light by water droplets in the atmosphere. <laughs> I didn't say that to my four-year-old son. You know what I said to him? God made that for you. And every time that kid, I probably still say it. <laughs> every time he sees it, he sees it, he's like, God, God made that for me. He'd stop us. We'd be driving on the road. Hey, mom, 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 God made that for me. I never expected his ability to listen to match my ability to speak. And the same is true for God. He will always speak to you in a way that you can understand. Do you know that he has no need to use churchy vocabulary that you don't speak in? He doesn't. Do you realize that he has no need to speak to you in uh, the King James English? <laughs> and this may blow some of your minds, but that was actually not Jesus' native language, King James English. It wasn't. He wasn't born saying like, I beseecheth thee to beeth my beloved soneth and daughtereth. He doesn't lift. He, has no, he doesn't need to lift, right? He can just talk in ways that you can understand. Here's what he does say to every one of his children. You hear his voice. You know his voice. And he adjusts his speech to match your ability to listen. He's a good dad. He's a good dad who speaks to his kids. So what are the ways that God, that we hear from God? I just want to run down a few of these really quickly. Um, different ways that we hear from God. This is not exhaustive. These are just things that I've experienced in my own life and um, ways that, that, that I've heard from God over, over the years. The first one is his word. We talked about that. If you want to hear his voice, get in his word. If you want to start to clarify and hear God to a greater degree, crack open the book, get into his word, because he, he sounds like what he wrote. The second one is his presence. This is a different one. This is one that's like maybe a little surprising to you, but his presence is his voice. Did you know that? You ever been there where you just all of a sudden feel the presence of God? Do you realize that he doesn't just show up to give you holy goosebumps? He shows up to either confirm things in your life. He shows up to bring a deeper understanding of who he is. He shows up to bring healing. There's different anointings that will come into a room for God to be able to move in different ways as the Holy Spirit wants. His presence is his voice. And so when you, when you sense God's presence, continue to seek him. Don't think that just his, the Holy Goosebumps is why he came. He came to move, to mold, to make, to break, to... to, to to deepen that relationship with us. It isn't just thunder, is my point. The third one is inner witness. I call it inner witness. It's kind of this idea of like, you, you maybe understand this, where it's like, it's kind of this general idea of like yes or no. Like you kind of either get like peace about a decision or pause. Or maybe just straight up, no. Like you're like, no, this isn't something that I'm supposed to move forward into. It's this general inner witness of like, I, I just, I, I feel like God's wanting me to do this or I, I'm really not. I don't have peace about this. And people will often say to me things like, well, oh, Pastor Justin, like, I just don't, I can't tell if it's like me or if it's God. Like I, 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 I kind of feel like maybe he's leading me to do this, but I don't know. Maybe it's me, maybe it's God, but how, how do I know? Here's a question for you to consider. 
Here's a question. How often do you hear him say no? If you don't hear him say no, then you're probably listening to yourself a lot. I'll move on. <laughs> okay. The, the next one is promptings. This is kind of um, maybe a little bit what like Pastor Trevor was talking about, where he just like couldn't get this person off his mind. He's like, I don't know, I just got to contact this person. I, I, I just can't shake it. Maybe you've had these things where like somebody just pops into your mind. You're like, I don't even, I haven't talked to this person in years or whatever. And maybe it's to call someone, to text someone, to invite someone to something, to, to give to, some, to something that God's just saying, I want, you to, I want you to take your seed. I want you to sow it in this ministry, in this place, in this person. Maybe it's to pray for someone. You've woken up in the middle of the night. I don't even know idea. I just felt led to just pray for someone's marriage. I, have, I don't even know what's going on. I'm just praying for them. It's a prompting. Follow the prompting. The next one is the inward voice. This is kind of like I've never heard the audible voice of God. I wish that I did, but I've had times where there's been an inward voice of God speaking to me where it felt like it was almost an audible voice where it didn't pass through my ear canal. It didn't go through my eardrums, but like, I felt like, man, I, this is, I almost feel like I heard this out loud. There's an inward voice when something just kind of comes to your mind that you weren't already thinking about. It doesn't pass through your cognitive process. It's just something that like God gives you a thought, something to do. This general, like the voice of the Lord for me comes out of nowhere. It'll be, I'll be worshiping and all of a sudden God will just drop something into my spirit. I'm like, I know that's not me because I know I don't like to give my money away. I know that's not me because I wasn't even thinking about this person. I know that's not me because this isn't what I normally would do. It's probably the voice of God, like the inward voice speaking over you. And it sometimes comes in the form of like a, a word of prophecy, a word of knowledge, a word of wisdom, whatever that looks like. The next one is dreams and visions. Um, in Joel chapter two, it says that uh, your old men will dream dreams and your young men will see visions. Um, so good news, as long as you're still seeing visions, you're young, right? <laughs> so just keep praying for visions, right? Just no, no dreams, Jesus. I want to be young. So keep, keep those visions coming. The only difference between a dream and a vision is one of them you have while you're asleep, the other one you have while you're awake. Um, and a lot of times you'll wake up in the middle, middle of the night, God has given you a dream. You don't maybe even necessarily understand it, but but you know that there's a, a spiritual meaning to something that God has deposited in you. Um, this past Sunday, we had two people in first service, totally separate from each other, have a vision of Jesus sitting on the front steps right here. Two people. They didn't even talk to each other. One lady came up and gave the word in first service. The other lady said, oh my gosh, I literally had that same vision during worship service. These are visions, like God, God kind of like opening up. And she's like literally like, open my eyes, closing my eyes, open my eyes, closing my eyes, open my eyes, closing my eyes, where God will literally unveil something either while you're awake or you're asleep to communicate something to you. And for in first service, he was holding out his hand saying, come to me, bring your woes, bring those things that, you, that you're holding on to so tightly. God, God speaks through, the, through, through things like that. Um, the last one is this, other people. And this is weird that I left it for last because other people is usually how we depend on hearing from God. You know, I, I get words from people. People will give me a pro prophetic word. They'll write it down or speak it to me. I, I write them all down. I keep them in a file folder. I, if, it's, if they speak it to me, I'll type it in there. I have it in my notes section so I can go back to it. Some of them are weird. I have no idea what they mean, right? It's like, I see a flood coming and this and things, but it's a good flood, not a bad one. I'm like, I I have no idea what you're talking about, but I'm going to write it down. We'll see what happens, right? Like, so I just received these things. And here's the thing. I kept this thing for last because I think that for far too long, especially in the charismatic um, vein of, of, of church in America, we have become dependent on other people to give us words. You're still waiting for Tunde Balanta to come back to give you your next word that you heard eight years ago. Like, like we, we become dependent, and I just want you to know, a good father speaks to his kids, and he doesn't set up a dynamic where he only speaks to certain siblings. I won't speak to you. I'll speak to your older brother, and then he can speak to you. A good dad speaks to his kids. And he'll speak to others, but man, he wants to speak to you. 
He really wants to speak to you. He's a good shepherd. And you hear his voice. Why don't you stand with me? Mm. Thank you, Lord. The third point, and I'll leave you with this, is this, that his voice draws you closer. His voice draws you closer. John 10, verse 5 says, but they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. But when you hear your shepherd's voice, when you hear your dad's voice, his voice draws you closer. We read in um, 1 Kings about Elijah. 1 Kings 19, Elijah is... This great prophet, but he's feeling all alone and needing to be reassured of God's presence. And so God says, fine, get ready. I'm about to pass by. And all of a sudden, this big, huge, violent wind comes by, but God was not in the wind. A big earthquake shakes all the rock, but God was not in the earthquake. Then a big fire comes, but it says that God was not in the fire. And then there was a still, small voice. God was in the whisper. So many times, God whispers. You know why? Because he's so close. Like in here, even today, like during worship, as things are going on loud, and there's a guy blabbing up here on the stage, and you, the person next to you whispers, and you, you can't hear him because of all the other things. What do you do? You lean in. Can you say that again? Just say that one more time. I think sometimes God whispers just so that we do that. Because he has no no need to yell because he's so close. He isn't some far off God that needs to get your attention. He's close and his voice draws you closer. And so often we want God to speak in the spectacular. We want him to show up in earthquake. We want him to show up in fire. We want him to show up in wind. I want to show up in a, in a text message from God or through my dog, like Balaam's donkey, right? Like I want God to just speak to me in the spectacular, right? But we have the Holy Spirit living, living on the inside of us, and that is spectacular, and this is normally a time where we're going to add in, add, like lead into this last song. And I just want to encourage you. It's a time where we start. you start looking around. Where's my purse? Where's the kids? Pastor went over again. Like all these things, like you start to think about. Can you just, just take a moment and pause? And don't miss the whisper. If you didn't hear when Pastor Trevor was saying, like, God, who do you want me to encourage? Ask him again during this last song. God, how do you want me to encourage this person? Maybe you ask a little bit deeper, Lord, what is it that you want me to do? Not just the person's name, but God, what do you want me to do for this person? So Lord, I pray for a fresh and filling of your spirit that may not look like holy goosebumps. It may look like us just leaning in to hear your whisper because you're so close. Lord, I pray you'd have your way in us individually, corporately, I'm so amazed at how we are beginning to move ahead on mission as a, as a body. I'm excited about what you're doing. I feel like you're awakening dreams and passions. You're taking latent gifts that have fallen asleep and rising them back up. Lord, I thank you that, that there are so many people here at New Life Church that are pulling their chair up to the table that are gifted and equipped to do that which we feel so ill-equipped to do. Lord, I thank you that you qualify the called. Lord, I pray you call us out to do greater things, not by the the sweat of our own brow, but Lord, when you put your super on our natural, we stand back amazed at what you were able to do. Lord, we thank you for that. We worship you. May we have pause and just listen to your whisper today. In Jesus' name, let's worship.